it may change in the next months. Okay, so I think we are in time. So good morning. My name is Manfred Sihut. I would like to welcome you all in the name of speakers and the executive committee. Vishali Gupta is already here. And um, well, we had already two nice webinars with a lot of participants. We were really surprised. I think last time we had 80 different countries with close to 1000 participants. There came up a few questions actually the last time, which we hopefully hopefully have solved now. Which we hopefully have solved in the moment. Um, the one is the CME and the documents. You know that you are getting CME points for participation, but only for the direct participation, not if you see these uh, courses on demand later on, which are available also from our starting from our web, side, web page uh, on YouTube. So if you're participating here, then the organization global will see that and send you after the meeting a evaluation form. Um, please return that. It's only about the quality of the meetings and how you feel it is. And uh, then uh, on your way back, actually, you should get both documents, the CME points and the participation document. If not, please contact the um, web page, the address, the email address, which is on our website, uveitiswebinar at gmail.com. It's if you go to the link to register for the meetings, there you will find that one. If you have no evaluation sheet, please put me also in CC so that I can get some kind of feedback what the problems are. Again, the videos were not playable the last time. Now web one and web two are on demand available um, there where you register. If you only scroll down, then you'll see these things. Well, we, let's go to our meeting from today. Deborah is also participating already. Good morning, Deborah. Very mm -hmm. nice. I have um, my coffee. Enjoy your coffee. Um, as you know, from the previous meetings, we have uh, questions and answers. If you have such questions, please go on only to the question and answer points here, not to the chat. Limit the questions there and limit the questions to the topic of the day. We cannot discuss all types of uh, uveitis and all things of uveitis. You know, we are planning 36, something like that, webinars. And there's a reason for it to, uh, to show you that it's such a big, big amount of uveitis uh, which we have to cover. So please limit your questions to the topics of the day. Um, then I would suggest that I start, sorry, here, probably with this one. Okay, so let's start with the anatomical types of uveitis and the typically associated disorders. Um, this is some kind of introduction, and you may remember, if you have seen the, both, the first two webinars, that we had similar things there too. But again, we have some new people. And I think it's also very important that um, the people, the speakers, bring in some personal um, opinions about that general topic. So my first slide should show you probably... Uh, the amount of patients you have in your office, let's suggest that they all have uveitis. And to be really effective, it would be very, very nice to find out, to sort out the differences between your patients. And my first and then also the second talk should allow you to differentiate uh, similar types of uveitis. As you know, epidemiology of uveitis, the incidence approximately 50 to 100,000 inhabitants, and most cases are anterior uveitis, approximately 50%, probably 60% outside of the specialized uh, groups. 
So how do you analyze uveitis? There are various forms and you can follow, for example, location. And that's what I wanna show you here. You can follow the cause, which is not always that easy. Etiology is a wonderful thing, but actually you cannot always know the etiology, especially at the beginning. Morphology helps also. So all of these different forms of uveitis may probably end up with different therapies. Let's present the first one, the anterior uveitis. You know, these, uh, these names, locations are always determining where are the, where is the center of your inflammation. In anterior uveitis, this is definitely the anterior chamber with a mild spill over probably, then you have iridocyclitis to the vitreous. Typically, you see pictures like that one with an active uveitis, active anterior uveitis, here with reddening on, this, on the limbal part and more or less uh, stenic air. Then a very important chapter are the endothelial precipitates. We will cover that one in the second talk and later on too. Very, very important and very helpful. Now, let me introduce you to a concept, which I think is very helpful. It's called the leading criteria. That should help you to find out if you have any associated disorders or not. So the leading criteria for these three types, anterior, intermediate, posterior uveitis are different. Again, this does not work always, but I think it's highly effective. And for me, it works in a, in a lot of situations. So the leading criteria for anterior uveitis for me is laterality. I check the laterality of the patients. So it's always the same eye. Think strongly about viral anterior uveitis. There are some other criteria besides laterality for this one, and we will discuss it a little bit later. If this is changing, but only one side after the other, that's what we call ping pong mechanism. And that's what I summarize as HLA-B27 typical acute anterior uveitis. More about this one in my next talk. And then we have a small group of approximately only 10% where both eyes simultaneous are involved with anterior uveitis. And here think definitely about systemic disorders. Let's go to the second type of uveitis, which is intermediate uveitis. Again, here you have center of inflammation in the vitreous, probably also with a mild spill spillover phenomenon into the anterior chamber. So even two plus cells could fit into such an intermediate uveitis. Very clear findings dense vitreous behind the lens and classically snowballs. So if you have snowballs, I would definitely not call it any more anterior of uveitis only. You can have vasculitis, very classical. We will discuss that later. And you can have snowballs like this one, more fibrin uh, strains. Um, we will see that in the next, one of the next talks. So the leading criteria for me in intermediate uveitis is H. That means that children, young age, nearly never have any systemic disorders. Think about Tino syndrome. We will discuss that only very limited. Probably uh, Deborah will uh, go to this one a little bit more in detail. But please be also aware that we have our own talk, our webinar about kids' uh, pediatric uveitis, I think, in a very few months. But again, it's hard, very rare that you find any associated disorders to your intermediate in this young age. With adults, it becomes sometimes MS starts uh, up to 10% and also sarcoidosis. And the question is, when should we start probably in early diagnostics to find out MS? That's some type of controversy. We probably come up to this one in, you know, at the end when we have some time about the controversies. And in older patients, never ever think about that this is simply idiopathic. You have to find signs of intraocular vitreoretinal lymphoma. Um, uh, intermediate uveitis is not a disease of 60, 70, 80 year old people. Please be aware of this one. Third location is posterior uveitis. Again, here you have inflammation of the posterior segment, means retina or choroid. That comes, may come with vitreal inflammation, probably completely without anything, and may come even with mild anterior uveitis. If it's stronger anterior uveitis, of course, then you know that you talk about pen uveitis. 
Well, with the near, uh, leading criteria in this situation, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I would suggest at first to find out the localization of your inflammation. Differentiate if it's retinitis, then always think about that's nearly exclusively infectious with very rare uh, exceptions. Think about if it's retinochoroiditis, and I think in most places in the world it's toxoplasmosis. And think about chorioretinitis, that may need further differentiation then. But um, yeah, here you see acute retinal necrosis. Classical situation of toxoplasmosis, retinochoroiditis with some bleeding and here an old scar. And even here you have toxoplasmosis, old scars in the neighborhood and here the active disease. Here scarring, pepper and salt fundus of syphilis. Here a case of tuberculosis. Very classically sign of white dots. This is a birdshot uh, choroidopathy and here you have some histoplasmosis spots. Here with exudative retinal detachment, I think most of you are aware that this is highly suggestive of Voko and Nagiharada syndrome. But again, and this is vitreoretinal lymphoma. Again, this is not the place to talk in too much about posterior uveitis. The next webinar in one month will cover uh, posterior uveitis in all different details. Well, macular edema is a major, major complication of all types of uveitis. It's definitely not a sign that you have posterior uveitis. Let's go back to measurement quickly. Anterior uveitis, you know, we have cells in the anterior chamber and you should count them, or you can actually even measure them with a laser flare photometer. And uh, the Sun criteria from the, I think, 2006 or seven, described, uh, following a little bit the ISG criteria, um, the grading of cells per field. So you count them, normally we count them for 10 or 15 seconds and then adapt it to a minute. And this is very, very helpful. Probably one point, if you have kids, especially kids with JIA, please be careful. It may be the situation that these are cells are extremely small and I take my time of approximately 10 seconds to analyze going with a slit lamp front, back, front, back, if there are any cells. And normally it takes a few seconds to find these small cells in kits. Sun criteria also defined the begin with sudden and insidious and the duration, which is limited in up to three months and persistent if it's longer than three months. They also define the cause, which is acute in sudden onset with limited duration or recurrent. They have multiple episodes in, in between intervals without inflammation and without therapy at least three months, or it can be chronic. And there you have persistent uveitis with recurrences with less than three months free of recurrences after stop of therapy. You should try to find out this for your patients, definitely. The more complicated the patients, <clears throat> the more you should find out about this one. So that's all super easy. But there are a few things. I mentioned one of them already. Edema of optic disc and macula. That's a possible complication of all types of uveitis, and it's definitely not automatically posterior uveitis. Very important. It's a complication and not part of the anatomical classification. And another thing which may happen if you have a really irritable cyclitis, which may respond with anterior chamber cells very nicely to your topical steroids, uh, it will take longer, much longer time than to see a response also to your vitreous cells. So that's definitely not a change from irritable cyclitis to intermediate uveitis. I think that's not that difficult and that's a classical finding of optic disc edema. Okay, so I hope I helped you a little bit to bring in some order in your population of your office. And then if you look a little bit more clearly, then you see there are simile couples. There are groups, different groups, and they have to be treated different. They also belong together, yes? So this feels much, much better. And you can use your experience, which you hopefully also got from our webinars. 
So in conclusion, classification, anatomical first, very helpful. Then try to work with these leading criteria. I think it's very effective. Again, leading criteria help a little bit to define probably as associated disorders. I think they are nearly always helpful. The exam classification, very important, starting uh, to define the begin, duration, and course, and still think about the uh, uveitis is still a rare disease by definition of World Health Organization. We wrote a whole book about these things, and it's highly recommended. And thanks for your attention. So, my I think I will go on directly to my second talk. And now concentrate only for anterior uveitis. Well, there's an easy way to work with uveitis, I think so. At first, please be sure you are talking about anterior uveitis and not something which starts as anterior uveitis, but ends up with, let's say, acute retinal necrosis. So you have to analyze definitely the fundus to find out this is anterior uveitis. Then use the history, use your slit lamp. This will be a major thing for the next talk. You have to measure probably the IOP and of course also fundoscopy. I think there's only limited lab work necessary, but there will be a talk following this one here and same with the treatment. We will cover this one with a, one of the next talks. So let's go a little bit into the differential diagnostic criteria for anterior uveitis. Um, I mentioned laterality. I think that's the begin. When a patient comes in, I try to find out what about laterality and that helps tremendously. Again, both eyes is quite rare. I see that in probably less than 10%. And then let's go to find out any systemic disorders. Very, very important. With the other ones, it's possible that a systemic anterior uveitis, systemic associated disorder, anterior uveitis starts only with one eye. But the chance for the, this is less than you have a disease which is limited to your eye. So that's my comment to both eyes. If it's always the same, I think about viral anterior uveitis. I will give you some more ideas. What about viral anterior uveitis and what do you have to think about and what to make to establish your diagnosis? But let's first start with this one. If it's changing sites, which I, we call ping pong mechanism and which I call HLA-B27, typical acute, very important acute anterior uveitis. So let's see, this is defined purely clinical. You have an acute red eye. It's unilateral, but with changing laterality. And most of these patients report about preclinical sensations. Um, it seems to be some ciliary, um, part of the eye which uh, brings in the pain, the ciliary body. And this is approximately, let's say half a day to one day before the eye becomes red. Very, very typical sign of this type of disease. And that's by the way, the begin to treat. You should give this, to the, this information to your patients. What about HLA B27? Well, B27 are positive more in men, but of course, a lot of women also uh, have the same disease and they are more negative. It's also that you have more associated, classically associated disorders, but these are more in men, but these are not, definitely not seen in women. It's also seen. So you, have, you can have both B27 positive, negative, um, you can have even be 27 positive people with ankylosing spondylitis, which do not have this type of uveitis. So we regularly see patients which have a viral induced uveitis. So it's not that B27 is a must to have this type of disease. For me, it's the treatment is independent if they are B27 positive or negative, but they have to have typical uh, this typical disease. 
Let's go to some of the diagnostic criteria. The first is you have anterior uveitis, biscornial involvement. You know, syphilis, Lyme's disease, which I think is very rare in this world, but syphilis, you never should overlook this. Think about sarcoid tuberculosis, leprosy, the classical granulomatous diseases. They all may come, uh, may show up with uh, keratouveitis, recurrent polychondritis, something which induces much more uh, scleritis than uveitis, but it can be also producing keratouveitis, Kogan syndrome classically too, and never forget HSV, VZV. Keratouveitis by herpes, very classical. So that's a classical finding. In our world, we would say immediately, well, this looks like sarcoid. Why? It's not that you have posterior synechia here. It's not that you have massive granulomatous uh, precipitates, which are classical, it's this one. If you see this one, these are anterior synechia, and you find this nearly exclusively in so dramatic in granulomatous disorders. So that in our Western world would be classical finding for sarcoid. It would probably in India, classical finding more for tuberculosis than for sarcoid. Varzella zoster, also massive cartilage uveitis. Second differential diagnostic criteria I want to mention is pigment defects. They can be sectorial, classically, with never forget narrow angle glaucoma, of course, but then it's more a sign of zoster than if you have a focal uh, pigment defect that could be more simplex or Fuchs. Then you see in Fuchs, you see that regularly, but very mild, but then you see multiple fo foci of uh, pigment defects. Here you see one more larger extension and here more a focal one and here two. The third one is iris color irregularities, and that's actually sometimes induced by pigment defects. Again, you see here your HSV, VZV. So I differentiate that in heterogeneously, so a bit of iris color irregularities, or more homogeneously, and that's classically seen in Fuchs, or in xanthogranuloma. This is a benign tumor I will show you very soon. In Fuchs, you please don't miss heterochromia here in the name. Uh, we decided to call it simply Fuchs uveitis. In Fuchs, you see heterochromia in approximately 10 to 15%. No reason to have this heterochromia also in the naming. Fuchs uveitis is, I think, the best uh, to call it. That's the classical Fuchs. You see, this is really quite different here. And that's another very clear, uh, typical case. Xanthogranuloma, a benign, a more dermatological tumor, actually. And you can see here that there is a massive color difference. It's in very, very young kids. I'm not so sure that a lot of you have seen that before. These kids sometimes have some kind of benign tumor also on the head. And uh, the adequate treatment, by the way, is high dose steroids or limited radiation in these kids and it completely disappears. So it would be wrong definitely to treat these kids with, let's say, five times topical steroids for months. This is not really helpful. Well, this is, of course, after surgery a situation. So be very careful to estimate your uh, iris color changes after a more um, adventurous cataract surgery. You see there happen, has happened some things and of course the iris has suffered a lot. So you should be careful um, not to get confused. False is endothelial precipitates, extremely important because with this one, you can really uh, show quite exactly in what type your patient belongs to an interior. Typically, the, the textbooks tell you arts triangle, very nice. Then you can differentiate granulomatous from non granulomatous. Of course, you see that in granulomatous diseases, but also in more severe other forms like HSV. So I think it's very limited the number of non granulomatous cases, but in HSV, you definitely see that. 
something which sometimes is difficult to see is this dust-like pattern, which we find in B27 typical enteriviitis. Then if it's distributed all over more star-like, it's fuchsuviitis. Probably you find some patients with fuchs without any precipitates, then it's maybe a little bit difficult. But if it's very uniform, this star-like star -like, uh, precipitation all over, it's absolutely classical fuchs. And finally, centrally or paracentrally, my major pay, most of my patients with HSV or VCV shows this classical endotheliitis. Well, if this is too theoretical for you, what about this one? Here you see in A, the classical granulomatous pattern and very similar, but hardly visible here, the dust-like. That's of course Fuchs pattern. And this is what we call endotheliitis, centrally, paracentrally, far away from the limbus, highly suggestive for uh, viral disease. Again, if you have a patient with B27 positive ankylosing spondylitis and uveitis showing this type, B type of uveitis, this is not B27 typical acute anterior uveitis, especially when the pressure also is raised. Art triangle, quite kilometers. This is difficult to make photos from, but probably you can see here the dust-like pattern of B27 typical disease. Here, the classical endotheliitis of a patient with HSV. And here, the classical finding of Fuchs stellate precipitates all over. This is extremely important. So for me, this is a second step in the analysis of my anterior uveitis. Next one is Aris nodules. If you have them, you mostly find some kind of associate disorders. Well, think about the granulomatous diseases, of course. These have classical uh, nodules. If it's really curious, if it's really weird, think about tumors and then probably metastasis. Let me show you this one. This was a kit with tuberculosis and that's a um, leprosy patient, one of the few I've ever seen. And here's some iris granulomas. And here some uh, iris granuloma. Pupillary was the one before. This is an iris granuloma by a patient with sarcoid. And this is something, sorry, this is not simply granuloma. This is not, uh, this is weird, yes? If something like this is shown to you, be very careful. This looks like metastasis and it was a uh, breast metastasis in a patient. Let's go to the next one, anterior chamber. We can have hypopion and we can have the same thing with some blood. Let's stay with hypopion. Classical finding hardly seen in the last years in Bechet's disease and that may move. So that's something you can differentiate this one by the B27 typical AAU, which does not move. But also be aware in HSV, VCV, you can find hypopion, never forget endophthalmitis, and don't get fooled by pseudo-hypopion. I show you very soon what this is. Hypopion, very classical. And if there is some blood in, traumatic, I think is number one, ischemic ophthalmopathy in all the patients, typically with both sides, rubiosus iridis. So that's also something you can really differentiate from uveitis, I think. Never forget HSV, VCV, very classical findings with blood hypopion uh, in HSV. And xanthogranuloma, the one I've shown you before, also had uh, some blood in. Here, a herpes patient. And this is pseudohypopion. You can see this one here. Uh, this is not part of a hypopion. And you see there's not a straight level. It goes up here on the sides like a ship. Yeah, so I um, hope that you are realizing what this is. This is retinoblastoma in a form typically seen in kids between eight and probably 15, 16. So a little bit more later response to retinoblastoma. And you definitely should not get fooled about this one that you treat them like uveitis. Very important criterion is secondary glaucoma. Of course, be sure that this is not steroid induced. 
So that's sometimes a little bit complicated. But if you have a patient which without any steroids has already increased pressure, think about, have a look for this one. These are all viruses. Virus seems to increase with trabeculitis the pressure. HSV, VZV, the Postman Schlossmann syndrome, which mostly in the Western world, I think is CME, uh, Fuchs, rubella, have to think about rubella. So this is all very typical. I think if you have really pressure, increased pressure, then think about viral induced uveitis. This HLA-B27, typical acute anterior uveitis, in this situation, the pressure is normally even a little bit lower in the inflamed eye. And I don't know why, but also recurrent polychondritis can uh, induce higher pressure. Here you see that in a herpes patient. And one of the last criteria is this clero involvement, sclero uveitis. Think about gonomatosis with polyangiitis, Wegener's disease, previously called the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, very typically. The, the granulomatous disorders, again, tuberculosis, syphilis, leprosy, um, sarcoid 2, sorry, sarcoid 2, uh, recurrent polychondritis, and don't forget this one here, which I have seen only in young patients, so something between 10 and 15, a pseudotumor orbitae can really induce um, massive sclero scleritis with anterior uveitis, like in this patient who had a very, very painful eye. The MRI showed the swelling and with steroids, it was highly effective. It worked very well. Um, pseudotumor orbitae in adults does not show anterior uveitis. So there you may have more changes on the posterior segment. My last criterion is a white eye. It's not, this is the harmless one. It could show that you have peri-intermediate uveitis, which hardly ever shows a red eye. Then think about juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which mostly is bilateral, but not always bilateral. Same as intermediate uveitis. Um, it may start with one eye especially, but if you analyze very nicely, I think probably even in the second eye, you may see one or two snowballs in the periphery without massive vitreous cells. So that's a sign of intermediate uveitis. And these are the classical signs of juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated uveitis. That could be, it could have even three plus cells, this one. And classically they have gone arthritis. Um, the less joints are involved, the more severe the eye disease is. Some words to this one. Um, we should differentiate two types, the HLA-B27 positive ones, which are similar to the adults in ankylosing spondylitis, or the ANA positive ones. And if you have ANA, then this is a classical finding of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. You should analyze these both types quite soon. If both are positive, it seems that in nearly all cases I am aware of, the ANA positive type, so the much more dangerous, uh, quiet, uh, not so red eye is the leading cause of the uveitis. Um, the only thing I want to mention, you know, again, we have in our own webinar about kids uveitis. I think that's a very important thing. Uh, you have to find out about the oligoarticular cases, uh, the ANA positive ones, and this shows a control period in cases where you do not have any activity. And uh, with our big register in Germany, we defined definitely, I think it's the same for the United States, that you have a high risk of uh, inflammation, um, which is clinically not seen if you have um, ANA positive oligoarthritis and polyarticulitis. So these people, if they are younger than seven years, we control every six weeks, even if there is no uveitis. So how to diagnose anterior uveitis in conclusion, exclude intermediate and posterior uveitis. I think that's a must. Laterality as a first differentiation marker. The second one would be for me, the endothelial precipitates. They help you tremendously. 
Think about this idea of HLA-B27, typical a acute anterior uveitis. It helps a lot to differentiate these patients from others because, again, you can we have a lot of experience how to treat these patients. Start steroids with these um, first symptoms the patients have immediately, probably every hour, and then the chance to develop hypopion or to need systemic uh, steroids is very, very low. Then I've shown you some things about the differential diagnosis. You need this lit lamp, you have to measure the IOP, probably some other things, but this is not really difficult. This is not something which is important. So please be aware, this is simple uh, diagnostic and uh, ophthalmology. Blood work, I think, is rarely necessary, but sometimes you probably have to do it to exclude syphilis, Tino syndrome, JRA, JRA to, to look for ANA antibodies. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. What's up next? Yes, thank you, Manfred, for both the talks. And uh, we move on to Debra next. Certainly. Oh, we are more or less in time. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Debra. Manfred, All right. And you have a lot of questions to answer, which you can take up. I can do in the queen, meantime, yes. Absolutely. And Debra, it's a privilege and honor to invite you to talk about clinics of intermediate uveitis. And for all the attendees, Debra's really woken up early morning for all of us. Big thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had my coffee, so we're good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, even if I did have to get up obscenely early. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about clinical features of intermediate uveitis, things that you can use to help you decide what is going on with the patient. So intermediate uveitis, by definition, the inflammation is centered in the vitreous cavity, plus or minus the peripheral retina. And pars planitis is a particular idiopathic intermediate uveitis, which is the one that typically has snowbanks and snowballs. So you can see this picture here showing you these beautiful snowballs coming off an active snowbank. We have a huge differential diagnosis for intermediate uveitis. So I've said that pars planitis is idiopathic. You can also have other idiopathic forms, kind of weird to have two types of idiopathic um, intermediate uveitis. Um, one of the things that we need to think about, particularly in younger adults or even older kids, is multiple sclerosis. We think about granulomatous causes, uh, sarcoidosis. Whenever you say sarcoid, think TB. Whenever you think TB, think sarcoid. Syphilis is in the differential diagnosis for absolutely every form of ocular inflammation. Inflammatory bowel disease can present with intermediate uveitis. So Dr. Zierhut talked about classic B27, ankylosing spondylitis, um, anterior uveitis. Inflammatory bowel disease may be B27 positive, but that can present with anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, cystoid macular edema, scleritis can present with anything. We can see quite a lot of intermediate uveitis in tubulo interstitial nephritis syndrome. We classically think of that as a bilateral acute anterior uveitis, but in fact, we see very frequently intermediate uveitis and even posterior uveitis in these patients. Particularly in an older patient, when we see vitreous cells, we need to think about intraocular lymphoma. These cells are often very large. These cells are white and they're larger than what we typically see in sarcoid, for example. If you see a child with what looks like purely unilateral pars planitis, Think about toxocariasis because pars planitis, as Dr. Zierhut said, is typically bilateral. So just think about toxocara. In an older patient, we think about Whipple's disease, and then we can think about masquerades, both malignant and non-malignant. So what are the symptoms? Sometimes these patients have no symptoms, and this is picked up on screening, but the most common symptoms are floaters and decreased vision. And you can see this patient here. I focus the camera here in the middle of the vitreous to show you the extent of um, snowballs that we can see, but it's very often much more subtle than this. So again, pars planitis, a subtype of intermediate uveitis. This is idiopathic, and we tend to see this in children and young adults. 
And you can see this photograph here. This is a patient of mine who was 11 at the time, who has all of these tiny little snowballs in the posterior vitreous. And in fact, they're right in front of the fovea. And amazingly enough, he was minimally symptomatic, um, which just brings up the point that children can be very tolerant of floaters or decreased vision that adults would not uh, put up with. Um, here's another picture showing you these beautiful snowballs in the posterior vitreous. Um, Parsonitis is typically of insidious onset long duration, typically bilateral, but can be very asymmetric. And uh, as Manfred said earlier, the most common cause of decreased vision in these patients is actually cystoid macular edema. So don't assume that the decreased vision is because of vitreous cells. If possible, get a really good look at the fovea and OCT is very valuable. So on exam, we look for vitreous cells. By definition, they're present in active disease. Um, we can see the anterior third of the vitreous at the slit lamp without a lens. So I spend a bit of time looking with a dilated pupil behind the lens, behind the lens of the eye, um, looking for vitreous cells. And I like to distinguish between cells that are in the liquid vitreous or the solid or formed vitreous, because cells in the liquid vitreous will turn over much more quickly than cells in the solid or formed vitreous. So the cells in the formed vitreous may be around for months or years or decades. But if we clear the cells in the liquid vitreous, we get a good idea that we're getting control of the inflammation. Um, vitreous snowballs, here you can see these in the posterior pole and inferiorly, um, white or yellow, and they tend to be inferior because uh, gravity works. Um, we can see vitreous haze, we can see a snowbank. Um, this can be actually seen with the patient at the slit lamp with for uh, example, a 78 diopter lens, if you have the patient look very inferiorly or with a Goldman three mirror, very uh, much easier actually to look at with the patients with an indirect ophthalmoscope, the patient lying down and we often have to do sterile depression. We very often see vasculitis in these patients. We can see a visible vasculitis of the large vessels, but these patients also often have a small vessel vasculitis, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So here's a picture of a patient sewing snowballs that are very anteriorly in the vitreous. This is a child with pars planitis. Here is a patient with disease that uh, has, we have no vitreous haze. We don't see vasculitis, but you can see these beautiful snowballs. Here's a patient with very active disease. I'm actually scleral depressing in this picture. So this is actually um, a filmy snowbank, but we see all of these snowballs coming off of the snowbank. Sometimes you can actually see the snowbank without a condensing lens. This is a photograph that my retired uh, mentor, Howard Tesler took without using a lens. There's a very fibrotic snowbank that you could see with a patient just looking down without a lens. Um, we typically think of the snowbanks being just inferiorly, but sometimes they really do go circumferentially and this is really much more serious disease. Um, in active disease, these tend to be white and fluffy with cells coming off them, but in very inactive disease, it can look like a very fibrotic membrane. Um, these snowbanks can be vascularized, and um, actually in the differential diagnosis of spontaneous vitreous hemorrhage in a child is pars planitis, and that's because of bleeding from either a vascularized snowbank or a vascularized fibroglial tumor. So again, here's pictures of apt active snowbanks with cells pouring off them. And here's pictures of more inactive looking snowbanks. So you can see they're much more fibrotic looking. So what are the complications that we can get? So Manfred mentioned that cystoid macular edema is a complication of anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis. And again, in intermediate uveitis, that is the most common cause of decreased vision. We can get cataract and glaucoma both because of the inflammation and because of our treatment. So corticosteroids can increase intraocular pressure and develop cataract in many of our patients. And actually children are more susceptible than adults to the cataractogenic effects of corticosteroids. We can see retinal vasculitis, which I'll talk about. We can get a vitreous hemorrhage. Retinoschisis is actually very common. And I urge you to look for this, particularly in an age 
when we very often do intravitreal injections, which we typically do inferiorly, it's very important before you stick a needle in the eye to see that there isn't a small retinoschisis there because this um, is a great way to give the patient a retinal detachment. And obviously in the pediatric age group, anybody with um, occlusion of the visual axis, we worry about amblyopia. So cystoid macular edema, as I've said, most common cause of decreased vision. It would be hard to imagine missing this huge cystoid macular edema clinically, unless there's a lot of vitritis. But I do have to say that it's very easy to miss subtle cystoid macular edema if we still have preservation of the normal foveal contour. So my residents will often say, oh, there's a good foveal light reflex, there's no cystoid macular edema. But I can tell you, and unfortunately I didn't take a photograph of this patient, this patient has a beautiful foveal light reflex because we still have this lovely contour, but there is vision decreasing cystoid macular edema. So OCT is super helpful and actually so is fluorescein angiography as I will show you. We can see disc edema very frequently in uh, intermediate uveitis and children just tend to get more exuberant disc edema than do adults. I told you that you can see clinical vasculitis and these are two different patients, both of whom ultimately were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. This patient here was diagnosed with MS shortly after presentation with intermediate uveitis, but the second patient's MS was actually diagnosed almost a decade after the intermediate uveitis. But if you see a lot of retinal vasculitis that is clinical, just think about MS. And you notice I've chosen two pictures here where the vasculitis was superiorly. So this is intermediate uveitis, both patients had more disease inferiorly, but extensive vasculitis superiorly. Doesn't mean it's MS, but just think about MS in these patients. We can see vitreous hemorrhage, as I've said, this can be the presenting finding in children. We can also get retinal detachments, either regmatogenous, fractional, or exudative. As I've said, retinoschisis is very common. It can be a little hard to see, or it can be associated with retinal cysts that are much easier to visualize. Here's a picture, I'm actually pretty proud of this. I took this one with a Goldman for mirror lens, and this patient had large, retinal cysts associated with a 180 degree snow bank. Here's another patient showing here. Oh, here we can see the snow bank inferiorly. And here you get a hint of what you can see more clearly, the retinoschisis and the retinal cysts. Uh, OCT can really help, especially in cases where you think there's been a detachment. So this is a patient that I had followed for a long time with retinoschisis that had been completely stable. But then I noticed this demarcation line and you don't get a demarcation line unless there is a retinal detachment. So here you can see an inner wall hole in the retinoschisis. This is the retinoschisis. And then here is the retinal detachment. And we were able to get beautiful OCT photos inferiorly. So here you can see the retinoschisis, the split in the retina, and then extending more posteriorly, you can see that there is a retinal detachment. Very rare, but we can see a Coates-like picture. This was a girl who at the time was 17. She'd had intermediate uveitis since she was four years old. And you can see all of this Coates-like exudate. And this montage photo shows you the very inactive looking snowbank, but extensive exudate coming under the retina. Um, the picture is actually not rotated. You can see that the vessels are dragged and the fovea is dragged. And that's something that's often unrecognized or underrecognized that with early long-standing snowbank inferiorly, everything in the retina can be dragged down. We think of dragging in terms of ROP, but we can see it with pars planitis. So you can see that the fovea is really inferiorly displaced and the infratemporal vessels are actually going straight down. We can see neovascularization of the disc and even the retina that is purely inflammatory. This patient, I'm going to tell you, has no ischemia on wide field fluorescein, but you can see this lacy vas vascularization here of the optic nerve that shows up really nicely on fluorescein. In this case, this is inflammatory neo, and this went away with treatment of the uveitis without the need to use any laser. 
So I mentioned that you could see clinically visible vasculitis, but very importantly, we can get a widespread small and medium-sized vessel vasculitis that we can't see clinically. So I'm just gonna show you two cases to illustrate this because I think this is something that's very important. This is a 41 year old woman who came to me with two years of intermittent periocular corticosteroid injections when she had cystoid macular edema. She had a negative workup and she's self-referred because she says her vision is terrible. She said, they do an OCT on me. They tell me that I have CME and they give me an injection or they tell me I have no CME and that I'm fine, but I can tell you that my vision is terrible even though it's 2020 and even when I don't have cystoid macular edema. So on exam, she had two plus anterior vitreous cells in both eyes, no haze and no clinical vasculitis. And here's a montage of her color photographs. And you can see, this is a really unexciting set of fundus photos. There's no clinically visible vasculitis. You don't see any snowballs. I'm gonna tell you there was no snowbank. There's no vitreous haze and she's 2020. So why is she complaining? Well, here's her OCT and in her right eye, we don't see any cystoid macular edema. And in the left eye, we see a little bit of cystoid macular edema. So I'm gonna show you one thing you can do if you're not able to get a fluorescein and that's just look at the OCT retinal thickness maps because look at the retinal thickness map for the right eye in particular. There is no COMB seen on the OCT, but if you look at the retinal thickness map, the retina is much thicker than it should be. And we see that it's thicker around the vessels. And then in the left eye, that looks like it has just a couple of cysts. We can see that the retina is much, much thicker. So if you aren't able to get a fluorescein angiogram, but you can do OCT, it is very helpful to look at thickness maps. And you can do OCT in multiple areas and look at thickness map. And it's kind of, um, you know, a poor man's um, fluorescein. And I do this quite often in my clinic. Here is her fluorescein angiography. And you can see that there is widespread leakage from the disc to the periphery. There's very little leakage on the large vessels, which is why we don't see it clinically but we see leakage along all the small and medium vessels. And you can see angiographic cystoid macular edema in the right eye that we didn't see as CME on the OCT, although we did see retinal thickening and just very widespread retinal vasculitis. I will tell you that with immunosuppression, we got the uh, fluorescein angiography almost completely dry. So dry in the posterior pole, dry to the mid periphery. The far periphery just still has some leakage, but she is thrilled with her vision, which is now stable and doesn't fluctuate during the whole day. Our second case is a 36 year old woman. She's referred by a retinal physician and she's been diagnosed with macular edema in her right eye, secondary to a retinal vein occlusion, which is an unusual thing in a 36 year old. She's received six anti-VEGF injections in her right eye for a Vastin 2 ilea. She then develops anterior uveitis in her right eye, but it's felt to be secondary to the ilea. So then they treat that with topical steroids and restart intravitreal injections of a Vastin. But then she develops cystoid macular edema in the left eye. So clearly the story that made very little sense at the beginning makes no sense at all now. So on exam, her visual acuity is decreased in her right eye. It is normal in her left eye, but importantly, she has anterior chamber and anterior vitreous cells in both eyes. She has no clinical vasculitis and clearly no vein occlusion. So these were the fluorescenes that were sent by her referring physician. And you can see that there's a little bit of cystoid macular edema in both eyes. And this doesn't really help you understand why she has the CME. But when we do wide field, um, in this case, it was Heidelberg, and I have no financial interest in any imaging uh, companies. But when we do wide field Heidelberg, we can see that there's extensive vasculitis in both eyes. So this tells us this is primarily an intermediate uveitis with retinal vasculitis and cystoid macular edema. So this helps us guide treatment, but also helps us understand what's the underlying problem going on. This was never a vein occlusion. So, what other things can we see with intermediate uveitis? We can see macular atrophy, and that can reflect a lot of things. It can reflect long-standing untreated vasculitis, and most commonly we see this with under-treatment of cystoid macular edema. 
So I'm gonna show you one last case and I'm still on time. Um, this is a 36 year old woman whom I had treated for years, completely inactive on immunomodulatory therapy. She decided to stop all of her therapy. So here you can see she's 2020 in both eyes and has a pretty good looking macula. She stops her systemic therapy and not surprisingly the disease recurs. She wants to be treated at this point only with local steroid injections. So she gets cystoid macular edema. You can see intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid. She wants to get local steroid injections. We treat her with local steroids, the CME resolves. But she's not controlled properly because all she's getting is intermittent steroid injections. The cystoid macular edema comes back. We treat it. She refuses to go back on immunosuppressive therapy. The CME gets better, CME gets worse, CME gets better. And this is what we end up with. This is the cumulative damage from recurrent bouts of cystoid macular edema, where we actually have permanent loss of outer retina. So I'm gonna summarize about intermediate uveitis and end just on time. Intermediate uveitis can be idiopathic. It could be associated with a lot of different systemic conditions. Patients may present with floaters or decreased vision, look for cystoid macular edema. They can develop vision threatening complications and imaging could be really helpful to guide treatment, OCT, and if you can, wide field fluorescein. And then just to say, we really try not to just treat intermittently when things explode terribly, but control the disease so we don't end up with cumulative damage. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Beautiful images. Thank, Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. And again, I'm so happy to uh, yeah. invite our next speaker. Uh, I'm not introducing because they don't need any introduction. It's Sunfik from Singapore. And Sunfik will be talking about diagnostic methods in interior and intermediate geriatrics. So thank you very much to the IUSG for giving me this opportunity to speak. And um, good evening to everyone. So my financial disclosures with no relevance to the top. So the diagnostic method for anterior uveitis is based essentially on the history and clinical examination to provide important clues like what we've been hearing Manfred tell us. And uh, together with systemic features, we are able to create a list of differential diagnoses. And then we tailor investigations to confirm or rule out diagnoses. And it's very important for you to know the spectrum of uveitis in your practice, as it will help to put the number one diagnosis on the top of the list and the rare ones at the bottom. So as we've been hearing how are the differentiating factors in the history and clinical examination for anterior uveitis, very importantly, the laterality, the cause, the pressure, the type of keratic precipitates, the iris atrophy, whether it's stromal or pigment epithelial defects, checking for corneal sensation in viral diseases, looking for scars, presence of keratitis, and these ocular features together with systemic associations help you to actually come up with that differential diagnosis. And always remember, as mentioned earlier, to check the back of the eye to ensure that this is truly anterior uveitis alone. And you can see in cases like this that look like anterior uveitis, you may be missing a patient with acute retinal necrosis. If you did not dilate and you just checked with the 90 diopter at the back of the eye so to the posterior pole, you might miss all this area of retinal necrosis in the periphery. Even a patient with toxoplasmosis had a colleague do an anterior chamber tap because of the high pressure and was surprised that the diagnosis was toxoplasmosis because the patient had not been dilated and the lesion was in the peripheral retina. Also a case of vitreal retinal lymphoma, which almost looks like Fuchs uveitis. And if you had not dilated this patient to look at the periphery, you might have missed all these lesions. So how do we select the investigations? These are some examples. We use a series test to make a diagnosis. So for example, a patient who comes in presenting with acute anterior uveitis Fibrin is present and also a hypopion. Well, certainly if it is a younger patient having some backache, you might want to consider doing HLA-B27 haplotype testing, perform 
x-rays for the sacral eyelid and the lumbosacral spine if you're thinking of ankylosing spondylitis. Now, this picture would totally change if you had a patient who looked rather unwell, was running a fever, also gave report of chills and rigors, you found a relative afferent puberty defect. This patient, you may be thinking of endogenous endothomitis, and therefore you would ask for urgent full blood count, liver function test, because not infrequently we may have a clepsiella liver abscess, or urine tract infection or checks as gray as a source of infection. Now, if a patient with raised pressure, you would always suspect firstly a virus, although there could be other causes as mentioned earlier, toxoplasmosis, sarcoidosis, uh, other uh, infections like syphilis. Uh, but you know, the first thing we would do would be to obtain an aqueous PCR. We do not go to blood tests. Now, if this is positive for um, a virus, we would already have a diagnosis at hand so that we can treat the patient immediately. We also like to check the patient's corneal sensation because this may give a hint that this may be HSV or VZV infection. And also we like to perform endothelial cell count because this may be drastically different from the fellow eyes endothelial cell count in cytomegalovirus. Now, we have a patient with granulomatous KP, posterior sinicare, and especially if you saw 10 like purple anterior sinicare, but we'll be thinking more of sarcoidosis than tuberculosis, and definitely we want to uh, have a chest x ray or a CT scan of the thorax, a MANTU test, quantiferon gold test, or ACE. So, always in all these patients, regardless, I would put the patient through a test for syphilis because this is the greatest mimicker. So if you find really nothing from the systemic history examination or uh, from the, 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 the clinical findings to suggest a specific diagnosis, this would be some of the basic workup I would do for anterior uveitis screening for overall health, immune disease. Uh, I would usually do a HLA between seven haplotyping because if it is positive, then I would just tell the patient, well, this is... Uh, your diagnosis, uh, most likely you would be expected to have recurrent diseases and so on. Uh, and of course, if you had any back problems subsequently, I would tell the patient that this uh, may be part of, you know, development of uh, spondyloarthropathy. Uh, syphilis serology, um, ACE, lysozyme soluble IL-2 receptors, it's available to you for sarcoidosis. For TB, typically I would do all three tests in my clinic, quantiferon gold, T-spot TB, uh, the typical skin test, and uh, where indicated, I would also do a chest x-ray or CT thorax, especially if I'm suspecting sarcoidosis, and then where indicated with previous exposure, Bartonella, Lyme, or uh, TDU, all right, serum and urinary beta-2, macroglobulin, uh, urine microscopy, uh, creatinine, and this would also be the same for a child with bilateral non granulomatous uveitis, but also include anti nuclear antibodies, as we've been hearing about. So, I think very often today um, we do an anterior chamber tap in a patient with anterior uveitis in my clinic. And very often we are asked by our residents when should we be thinking of performing a tap? And I think if you suspect an infectious etiology, right? So, we would want to get PCR or if available to you, Goldman Whitmer coefficient factors, we actually look for the antibody production. You might want to get cultures or stains, or when we suspect a masquerade syndrome where we want aqueous for cytology, although in some of these cases, uh, acquiring vitreous sample may be more useful. So what are the clues to the above? First of all, look at the type of keratic precipitates that the patient has, and also very useful surrogate is the endothelial cell count, which tends to be rather low in cytomegalovirus. So what I consider uh, infectious keratic breastfeeds would be those that appear infiltrating or uh, have a dendritiform appearance. So you can see from uh, confocal microscopy images and looking at the corresponding clinical images, you'll see that these do look infiltrating because the KP have got little extensions that go beyond the KP body and then really form, they actually join up together. And you can see in this case here, it is a vitreoretinal lymphoma. And this other case here is a cytomegalovirus infection. KPs that extend beyond the horizontal meridian, and you can see all these examples here, HSV1, VZV, syphilis. And if you see pigmented KPs, generally think of a virus etiology. Now, be very careful because um, you may be mistaken in a case of vitreoretinal lymphoma. They would also 
possibly have diffuse distribution of KPs, infiltrative KPs with pigmentation, and they can be mistaken for a virus. So it's very important to always check the back of the eye. Furthermore, masquerades, they tend not to have keratic breast dates nor flare. And you can see examples here, a patient with um, hypopian from a prosthetic cancer that metastasized to the eye. And if you dilated the patient, you would see these lesions in the fundus. This is a patient with acute lymphocytic leukemia. And another patient here with these iris nodules and a funny kind of KPs or, or, or deposits on the iris that were actually from a metastatic small cell CA of the lung. In the case where you have IOL related, intraocular lens related anterior uveitis, they also do not produce keratic precipitates. So this patient here actually really got me confused because he presented with typical cystoid macular edema, uh, a hyperemic disc, anterior chamber cells. And it was only when we performed uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy that we found that his lens was actually dislocating in shifting position as his changed his head posture and the lens was chaffing the iris causing the macular edema. And this other patient here who after surgery uh, who had apparently good vision had uh, chronic uveitis because the single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens had the haptic in the sulcus that was chaffing the iris. Now we look at intermediate uveitis We've already seen uh, many, many causes that have been explained by Deborah very clearly. Uh, just to highlight that most of the time when we investigate our patients, they tend to be uh, idiopathic when they are young, all right? It's not that they cannot have a diagnosis. It could have a toxocara, for example, but they tend more to be idiopathic. So the diagnosis of IU is based on meticulous history, examination, and theory tests to exclude infective causes and systemic causes, especially multiple sclerosis, and sarcoidosis. For the elderly, think of lymphoma. Now, the age at presentation, as you can see in this graph here, is a useful differentiator, although uh, this is not absolute. So it means that a patient in MS need not only be from 20 to 40, but may present even from 15 years onwards. And for the elderly, uh, we think of lymphomas, but I've seen patients even in their 30s with lymphoma. So very important, again, the history and systemic features. And depending on what the patient uh, reveals to us, it would help us to, to direct us to the specific diagnosis. For example, a patient with loss of sensitivity or paresthesias of hands, arms, or legs, we think of multiple sclerosis. And from there, we would then design targeted investigations. Clinical examination also is important to note. As mentioned earlier, the type of vitreous cells that you can see here, very large clumpish cells, and in fact, uh, varying sizes in a patient with lymphoma. We want to look at the peripheral retina for chororetinitis, choroiditis. So you can see a patient here with snowballs, the patient here with retinal vasculitis, and a patient here with even choroidal lesions. And in all these three patients, because they come from my clinic, they were all diagnosed subsequently to have tuberculosis. And this would definitely differ in your country, depending on what is more prevalent. Um, macular edema, you can see this is a photograph of a macular edema, which is something which we seldom stare hard at today because we have OCT available to us. Note that folks with vitreous syndrome and also tenu can cause vitreous with vitreous haze. So the basic workup for IU would include full blood count, ESR, C-reactive protein, syphilis, serology, uh, investigations for sarcoidosis because it is a common uh, cause, TB as well. And depending on what you find on history and um, examination, you might want to perform uh, MRI for a patient who has got neurological symptoms or you see extensive vasculitis in the periphery, vitreoretinal lymphoma uh, in the elderly, and uh, especially to obtain cytology from these patients and perform an MRI. And then if we're indicated uh, the, the various serologies to uh, confirm or exclude diagnosis. So just a word about in intermediate uveitis and MS. We know this is very important uh, discussion. Neuroimaging is not currently recommended for patients with IU unless they have already got neurological symptoms or signs or they are being evaluated for certain biologic therapies. There's no known predictive clinical or investigation findings to identify patients with IU at greater risk of developing MS later. And onset of MS-associated IU is not 
something in the pediatric age group that you want to think of. Uh, more commonly seen in females who present with relapsing remitting MS rather than a chronic kind of a uh, disease. Higher prevalence of peripheral retinal phlebitis and other vasculitic changes are seen in MS associated with IU. In the elderly, just one uh, slide on this, it's important to rule out vitreoretal lymphoma because it may be the first presentation of primary CNS lymphoma. Usually elderly patients, although young patients may also have it. The definitive diagnosis requires a vitreous biopsy and we should send a fresh sample or in a fixative such as preserved site. And it's important to liaise with your pathologist to expect the specimen, which we would want to send for cytology if there's adequate flow cytometry, IgH gene rearrangement, interleukin 10, or the ratio with interleukin 6. And most recently, a very, very uh, reliable uh, test would be the MYD88 mutation. So imaging in IU has already been touched upon. I routinely obtain wide field images for these patients for fundus photography to, to, to document the extent of vitritis and also vascular sheathing. Uh, OCT is very important to, uh, to um, diagnose as well as to monitor macular edema, optic nerve swelling, and very useful and very, very important is ultra wide field uh, fluorescein angiography and ICG, not just for macular edema, but mainly to detect and monitor peripheral vasculitis with leakage or ischemia even to look for choroidal or choroidal lesions and for neovascularization. So you can see images here, a patient with neovascularization where this lights up very early in the angiography, a patient here with choroidal lesions that was not easily detected clinically and also with vasculitis, but no macular edema. And if you look at the ICG, you can see multiple dark dots actually scattered all over uh, the fundus. And this patient here who looked uh, pretty quiet uh, in fact, had no cells in the vitreous, you will see the patient has got macular edema and extensive amount of uh, retinal vasculitis. So it's really important because it helps to detect active inflammation despite the presence of anterior inflammation in, 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 um, despite the absence of anterior uh, chamber inflammation or vitreous haze. So in summary, careful history taking and detailed clinical examination are crucial in the process of reaching a diagnosis. Target investigations, uh, help to exclude or confirm the diagnosis. It's also used to assess the severity and monitor treatment. A minimum basic workup for any anterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis includes syphilis serology and in my practice, definitely tuberculosis uh, screening. And for intermediate uveitis, I find that ultra wide field imaging is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you for making this complicated topic so simple, so big. Thank you. Very nice. Yes. I agree. So I guess there are already a lot of questions being asked on the treatment. So now we move on to the next important part of the management, that is how do we treat. With this, Deborah, who's wide awake by now, taking on coffee. It's all good. Okay, let's share my screen. I was sharing it and then I lost it. Let's try that again. All right. So the way I'm gonna discuss how to treat anterior uveitis is by presenting this as individual cases because I think otherwise it becomes a really long and boring algorithm. So I'm gonna present cases. So our first case is an 18 year old Caucasian male with pain, redness, and photophobia in his left eye for seven days. He's been on steroid drops every two hours for three days. He is not getting better. And his vision is decreased in that eye. The right eye is completely normal. So here is the slit lamp examination. And you can clearly see that there is a hypopian here, but we also see on top of that, a big fibrin clot. We see that he has started forming synechiae here. And you can see some injection, but be careful looking at a photograph um, in the corners and this is sort of bleached out. So we have a severe acute anterior uveitis. We know from the talks by Dr. Zirhut and Dr. Chi that we need to think about, um, and this is unilateral, we need to think about HLA B27 typical disease, but we also need to think about other causes. So we think 
Has he had trauma? Has he had surgery? Could this be infectious? Is he sick, but he's healthy? He's had no surgery. Um, he does have low back pain and stiffness, worse in the morning and worse with inactivity. Classic story for ankylosing spondylitis. His intraocular pressure is 10 on that side. It's 17 on the other eye, so it is lower on the affected eye. And his fundus examination, I can't stress this enough, there's no retinitis. The most important point I'm gonna make about anterior uveitis is the diagnosis of anterior uveitis is not made when you have cells and flare in the anterior chamber. It's made when you have cells and flare in the anterior chamber and you've looked at the rest of the eye and there is no retinitis or choroiditis, et cetera. So I assume this is HLA B27 positive, but it's his first episode, so maybe it's something else. I switch him actually to brand name uh, prednisolone acetate, and I have to tell him to shake it really well. So um, prednisolone acetate is a suspension, not a solution. You need to shake it like 30 times. I'm gonna put a little plug in here for everybody from India. Um, in the United States, the brand uh, prednisolone acetate from Allergan, Pred Forte, is about $400. We have multiple different generics in this country and some of them are horrible and don't work. And I think it's because the drug is very coarsely milled in clumps. Um, so I actually, when it is at all possible, if anybody is going to India, I have them bring me home Allergan prednisolone acetate from India. It costs about 40 rupees, which I think is 55 cents American compared to uh, $400. So I have them bring that back and I give out samples of the Indian Allergan prednisolone to my patients. I do not have shares in Allergan. I do not get money from Allergan. But every time one of my residence fellows or patients goes to India, they come home with a suitcase for me of drugs. So switch him to brand name Indian Allergan Pred Forte, and I put him on a short course of oral prednisone. So if this was a repeat attack, I could have um, given him a small steroid injection, but it's his first episode. I'm 99.99% sure this isn't endogenous endophthalmitis, but one is not 100% sure um, the first episode. So I put him on oral prednisone, minimal workup, B27 positive, syphilis negative. As Dr. Chi said, we test everyone with uveitis for syphilis. He actually did extremely well. Um, fibrin went away, symptoms went away, and the posterior synechia actually broke. So severe acute anterior uveitis, we treat very aggressively. We use topical steroids every hour. Again, prednisolone acetate is a suspensor. We need to shake it. Diflupredinate or Durazol is at least twice as strong as prednisolone, and we don't have to shake it. So it's a fabulous drug, except it is very likely to raise IOP, much more so than um, topical prednisolone. So just be very careful. And I don't like to use this uh, drop in children because I've seen IOPs in the 40s and 50s um, in kids treated with Durazol that unfortunately continued even after the Durazol was stopped and a couple of kids needed glaucoma surgery. Um, but so the drops are typically every hour while the patient is awake, we use uh, dilators and cycloplegics to prevent new synechia and break the fresh synechia that are there. Um, if someone has chronic anterior uveitis and they've had posterior synechia for years, you're not gonna break them except in the operating room. But with fresh synechia, you can break them with uh, synechia. We can often do a pledge in the clinic to break them. We may need a short course of oral prednisone and they can do very well with a subtenon or subconj injection of steroids. Our second case is a 53-year-old woman. She has a two-year history of anterior uveitis. She's been on prednisolone acetate four times a day for two years, is not getting better. She's also on timolol bermonidine combination twice a day. Her best corrected visual acuity is decreased on that side. The right eye is completely normal. Her intraocular pressure is elevated on that side, and she has cupping on that side. And here is her photograph. This is a classic picture of her pedic uveitis. She has pigmented KP, their KP here, um, um, kind of on the leading edge of where she has decimase folds, almost like a cotadus line. She has stromal edema and decimase folds, very atypical in uveitis, that's not herpetic. She has all the features that Dr. Zierhut and Dr. Chi talked about. So here there are central KP where they don't belong. Here's KP where they don't belong and they are pigmented and her pressure is elevated. We diagnosed her with herpetic uveitis, added oral antivirals, 
here she is after therapy. We're able to taper her to pred uh, acetate twice a day. Her pressure is well controlled. And you see that she has a pupil that is not round and there is some persistent iris atrophy. So just remember that you can't treat all anterior uveitis the same. You need to figure out if this is infectious or not. Our third case is a 38 year old woman. She has decreased vision in both eyes for three years. She has intermittent redness and has been treated with every possible drop in the world. Past medical history is not exciting. She has borderline diabetes and hypertension, which is very common in my country, even at a young age. She takes no medications, although on review of systems, she has asthma since she was 20 and occasional skin rashes. So here is her exam. She's got granulomatous keratic precipitates. Here they're in a giant Arlt's triangle. Oh, there we go, giant Arlt's triangle. And here's a close-up of some KP in the other eye, very large KP. <clears throat> in this case, they are white. Here is her gonioscopy. She's got complete synechial angle closure. And here you see a beautiful um, granulomatous iris nodule in the angle. So we work her up for syphilis, sarcoid, and TB. The quantiferon is negative. I'm gonna make the point that you cannot diagnose sarcoidosis without ruling out tuberculosis. Her ACE is elevated, her chest X-ray is normal. In this case, she was really concerned about finding out why. So we did get a chest CT, which showed hilar adenopathy consistent with sarcoidosis. So in her case, we aren't gonna treat her with steroids every hour. This has been going on for years. Somebody with severe acute disease, symptomatic can put drops in every hour. Somebody who's had fluctuating symptoms over two years is not using drops every hour. In her case, we put her on prednisolone acetate four times a day, and she ended up requiring systemic immunomodulatory therapy. So in chronic disease, we very often end up needing to continue systemic, to consider systemic immunomodulatory therapy, which Dr. Chi will talk about. In chronic uveitis, it's a lot more complicated for the patient because they often have no symptoms. So this becomes like the glaucoma patient with no symptoms, where we have to convince them why they're taking drops when their eyes don't bother them. The idea is to find the lowest drop of anti-inflammatory treatment that will control the inflammation while minimizing sequelae. And very important, we need to talk about the concept of chronicity. So patients often come to me and they say, look, my doctor didn't cure me, what's going on? I'm still on drops. And I explain that this is like high blood pressure. We control it, we don't cure it. Compliance here becomes a major issue. So very often patients do better with some local steroid injections that can be repeated every few months rather than very frequent topical steroids. And then again, uh, systemic immunomodulatory therapy. Our fourth, fourth case is a girl with chronic anterior uveitis. She actually has JIA, somehow wasn't screened. By the time I see her, she has posterior synechia and she has anterior chamber cells in both eyes. So chronic anterior uveitis in children is a little different than chronic anterior uveitis in adults. Kids are much more susceptible to the cataractogenic and glaucomogenic effects of corticosteroids than are adults. And causing a cataract in a three-year-old is much more severe than causing a cataract in a 70 year old A seven year old please God, will live long enough that they will eventually need cataract surgery anyways, and it won't be that long in the future. I don't like to see a two or three-year-old that needs cataract surgery. And here is what I'm talking about. This is a six-year-old girl with JIA who was managed exclusively with topical steroids. Um, actually, her physician told her that immunomodulatory therapy was poison and she shouldn't be on it. And she presents to me with visual acuity of light perception and hand motion, shallow anterior chamber because of this intumescent mature white cataract, still very inflamed and has posterior synechia. So please limit topical corticosteroids in children. Our fifth case is a 32-year-old neurosurgeon with decreased vision in his left eye. He's got floaters in his left eye worsening over the last year. He was born in the Ukraine. That is relevant, and I will tell you why. Um, he's healthy, takes no medications. Review of systems is unremarkable. His best corrected vision, the um, acuity is a little decrease in the left eye. Everything is normal in the right eye. Pressure is a little elevated in the left eye, but it's still okay. Fundus is normal. And he has these beautiful stellate KP through the entire cornea, 
classic for Fuchs uveitis. Um, this I'm cheating, this is not him because his disease wasn't this advanced, but you can see here the profound anterior stromal atrophy. So loss of anterior stroma that we see with Fuchs uveitis syndrome. Fine stellate KP through the whole cornea, enter chamber cell and flare, no synechia. He had a little bit of a PSC cataract and two plus cells in the anterior vitreous. So this is Fuchs. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the slide. This is Fuchs uveitis syndrome. Um, the reason I mentioned he's from the Ukraine is um, in um, many of our patients, this is related to exposure to rubella. And we've seen a dramatic drop in our patients born in North America or born in countries with ru early rubella vaccination since the institution of the rubella vaccination program. And he came from an area that did not have rubella vaccination. So why am I talking about rubella separately? It is a chronic anterior or anterior and intermediate uveitis. I'm talking about it separately because a third of the patients have glaucoma that is often resistant to medical therapy. So here, what we're treating is the glaucoma, not the uveitis. It's very rare that we need to treat the uveitis part of Fuchs uveitis syndrome, and they very often get cataract. They get cataract without steroids, and we just make it worse with treating them with topical steroids. So we follow them for elevated intraocular pressure and for optic nerve damage, but we don't treat the uveitis. So I'm gonna end a little bit early so that we end on time to say that we treat anterior uveitis that is um, acute very differently than we treat chronic disease. We treat chronic disease differently in children than in adults. There are some forms of chronic anterior uveitis where we don't need to treat the uveitis. And most importantly, you cannot diagnose anterior uveitis in the absence of a fundus exam. And these are three fundus photos of patients referred to me for anterior uveitis. This patient had granulomatous KP and a high pressure, but there is a toxoscar and there is an active toxo lesion that was missed. This is a patient who had um, very active anterior intermediate uveitis, but the referring physician never did a fundus examination. This is candida. This is candida and ophthalmitis. And this is a patient with acute retinal necrosis who unfortunately lost vision permanently because there was no dilated fundus examination for six weeks while the patient was treated as difficult to control anterior uveitis. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. It was a treat, an absolute treat to listen to you. Especially since I'm plugging drops from India. India, and I know <laughs> what to get for you now. Yes, seriously, if you come to my house, don't have to bring me wine, bring me Allergan Fred Forte for me. I'm coming next month. I'll get a lot for you. Perfect. Come stay with me. Thank you. So with this, we move on to another very interesting topic and very practical one, management of intermediate tubiitis. Over to Sunfri. Thank you. So... As mentioned, it's important uh, to look for underlying cause when you are dealing with a patient with intermediate uveitis, because if you do find one, then you want to treat the underlying cause. And as mentioned, the spectrum of disease varies with each country. And for us in Singapore, it's 71% are idiopathic and most reports around the world, it's about two thirds idiopathic. So when we deal with idiopathic in, in intermediate uveitis, it's important to know what the prognosis is in order to know how we should treat these patients. So in an adult, they generally have good prognosis for most except where there is macular thickening combined with active inflammation. So in a report from, uh, the, from Germany, about a quarter of patients with intermediate uveitis did not require treatment at all. And over a 10-year period of follow-up, 60% actually had preserved visual equity. In some other series, they would report about 10% developing sight-threatening complications and severe visual loss. Uh, so the causes of visual loss other than cystoid macular edema include glaucoma, cataract epiretinal membrane, retinal detachment. And if you do see an active snow bank, this represents a severe form of the disease. How about in children? Generally, this uh, would dictate a poorer prognosis compared to the older patients, especially those that are under seven years of age. They have a poorer visual outcome. They require a longer duration of treatment. They have a lower likelihood of remission, higher probability of developing complications. And in addition, their visual outcome is compounded by the development of amblyopia. 
So what is the general approach for treating intermediate uveitis? A quarter to a third of these patients have an underlying disease that needs to be treated and again, important to rule out malignancy and to look out for MS. A quarter to a third can be managed with intermittent regional corticosteroids indicated usually for macular edema. And the remaining a third to half require long-term systemic corticosteroids and immunomodulatory therapy, including biologics. So what are the indications for treatment? This is something that we have seen in the textbooks from many years, and this actually is quoted from 1996, right? So visual equity, worse than 2040, and that means that it's usually from vitreous haze alone, because if you do see macular edema, that would be an indication for treatment. Vitreous haze would be an indication for treatment, retinal vasculitis, and definitely neovascularization. So from very, very early on, 1984, you can see here that actually Kaplan had put out a four-step approach in his algorithm for treatment of intermediate uveitis, starting out with periocular steroid injections or systemic steroids. This was followed on with cryopexy using a double freeze-thaw technique and then another surgical method, past planar vitrectomy, and finally, immunomodulatory therapy. And I think you would be aware that today we actually do not have the same order of approach to treatment of intermediate uveitis due to the availability of better IMTs. Usually we would defer surgery to some state later. So the treatment options include regional uh, injections, mainly of corticosteroid, and they can be given by periocular injections, intraocular injections, suprachoidal injections, or in the form of slow-release intravitreal implants. We can also give systemic corticosteroids or immunomodulatory therapy and finally surgery. So periocular injections may take the form of a posterior subtenone or a transeptal injection. Usually we give trimcinolone acetonide, uh, 40 milligrams in a mil. And the complications to these injections would be increased pressure, especially in the younger patients, cataract formation, especially if it is repeated. Uh, aponeuroticosis has been reported and also repeated injections may cause inophthalmos and orbital scarring. Intravitreal steroid injections or implants, we can give uh, trimcinolone acetonide 0.4 milligrams in 0.1 mil as a neat injection into the back of the eye. This should be preservative free can also take the form of sustained release corticosteroid implants. And you can see the different uh, types of steroid that can be given, uh, different doses that last for about three years or four months. And some of them are non-biodegradable, whereas others are biodegradable. So in the end, with all these local uh, methods of uh, in giving steroid therapy, which really is the best? And uh, this was addressed in the POINT trial that was published in 2019. And it was found that both intravitreal and dexamethasone implant treatments were superior to periocular trimcinolone acetonide in resolving uveitic macular edema and improving vision. Dexa implant was non inferior to in vitro trimcinolone acetonide at eight weeks. The risk of having a high pressure was greater in patients that had intravitreal injections or implants than the periocular steroid group. And there was no difference between the Dexa implant and the intravitreal trimcinol injection. So what are the indications for steroid implants or injections? Unilateral disease, preferably rather than giving bilateral injections or bilateral disease. Contraindications to systemic steroid. Intolerance to systemic steroid. Persistent or recurrent cystoid macular edema. Contraindications include untreated infectious etiology, steroid responders, and as mentioned earlier, these should be avoided in children. The issues are variable duration of effect, reinjection or reimplantation is often performed only after relapse, and this results actually in cumulative ocular damage over time. How about systemic corticosteroids? This is the mainstay of treatment for more than 50% of intermediate uveitis cases. Uh, oral steroid, one milligram per kilogram body weight with a gradual taper to 7.5 milligrams daily or less very gradually according to clinical response. Uh, 
Indications include binocular involvement, uniocular involvement, not improving with periocular steroid injections, uh, severe disease. Uh, corticosteroids given systemically tend to be quick acting, but they are limited uh, by side effects. And at lower doses of 7.5 milligrams or less, they may be ineffective compared with immunomodulatory therapy. So which is better, giving a flocinolone acetonide implant, which lasts for three years to four years, or oral corticosteroids? So in this study addressed here, uh, th this question was the MUST uh, treatment trial. They found that at two years, the visual equity and macular edema improved in two thirds of eyes with implant or systemic therapy. And the implant actually had slightly greater improvement in macular thickness. But at uh, about four years, both uh, implant and systemic treatment did not differ. And based on cost effectiveness and side effect considerations, systemic therapy was recommended as the initial treatment for bilateral uveitis. Now, in the seven-year extended follow-up study, uh, the systemic therapy had better visual equity than flocinolone acetonide implant because uh, these cases had not been re-implanted in time. So these are some of the complications that were seen in uh, flocinolone acetonide implant. Cataract progression, this is like almost 100% would get cataract over time. Elevated uh, intraocular pressure about 60% would have that. Some cases have vitreous hemorrhage and rarely uh, you might see uh, the displant actually separated into two pieces or uh, endothomitis or retinal detachment. So what are the indications then for immunomodulatory therapy? The patient with no response or a case where it worsens on systemic steroids after having taken it for two to four weeks, or when the disease is not completely quiet after four weeks of high dose prednisolone, intolerance to systemic steroid, immunosuppression that's needed for longer than three months to spare the steroid, we give IMT, recurrence while on steroids, and definitely for steroid responders. So IMT may take the form of non-alkylating agents, which are either anti-metabolites or calcineurin inhibitors that we're all familiar with. You can see here examples of them. Alkylating agents like cyclophosphonide and chloramphucil were used in the past for refractory uveitis, but today we have a better and newer group of uh, medications that are probably going to uh, answer uh, be the answer to our refractory types of intermediate uveitis. And these are the biologic response modifiers, but it's very important to highlight that in all patients with intermediate uveitis, it is first necessary to rule out MS with MRI, right? So TNF-alpha inhibitors, IL-6 antagonists, interferon alpha may all be used with uh, reasonably good results. And if you're not really comfortable in giving IMT or your patients, uh, administration may be co-managed with a rheumatologist. So looking at the various um, corticosteroid sparing treatments in terms of the anti-metabolites, how does mycophenolate, which is newer than methotrexate, compare? So it was found in this uh, RCT that was published in 2019 that the use of mycophenolate milfotil compared with methotrexate as first-line corticosteroid sparing treatment did not result in superior control of inflammation. Now, another word about IU and MS. Neuroimaging should be done if the patient is being evaluated for certain biologic therapies. Anti-TNF agents can precipitate and exacerbate demyelination in patients with MS. CNS demyelination has been reported in patients with rheumatoid arthritis treated with tocilizumab. So it's best avoided if the, there's a family history that's positive for multiple sclerosis. In some instances, we may have a patient who has persistent cystoid macular edema in the absence of inflammation. So how do we treat these patients, especially when they are already on IMT? So we can give, in addition, local corticosteroid injections, intravitreal periocular and so on, or we could try intravitreal methotrexate or anti-VGF agents, although these have limited potency and repeated injections may be required. There are other potential modalities such as somatostatin analogs, interferon alpha drugs, which are actually really quite effective, and long-term low-dose acetazolamide. 
So coming to surgery, uh, as mentioned, Kaplan had talked about the use of cryopexy and also laser ablation of the peripheral retina. And we know that cryo can have uh, collateral damage and can cause uh, potential complications of worsening botrytis, macular edema, rheumatogenous or tractional retinal detachment, PVR. And therefore, if we did have to uh, do uh, ablation of the peripheral retina, we would prefer to use argon photocoagulation to treat peripheral retinal neovascularization. Uh, past plantar vitrectomy is uh, very useful in IU. It corrects the structural complications of uveitis helps to decrease inflammation in the anterior chamber and in the vitreous, and in reducing the amount of anti-inflammatory medication required postoperatively. It improves the visual outcome, reduces the cystoid macular edema, reducing the requirement for IMT dose. The indications for past plantar vitrectomy include peripheral retinal neovascularization with non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, rheumatogenous or tractional retinal detachment, Visually significant dense epidermal membrane, VMT at the macula, diagnostic vitrectomy for cytology, PCR, and cultures. Uh, just to mention an important message regarding pediatric intermediate uveitis. We normally would treat these patients with oral corticosteroids for a start, but we prefer to shift quickly to immunomodulatory therapy because the disease tends to be more severe, it's often bilateral, and it's chronic. We want to avoid corticosteroid injections in implants and the long-term use of oral steroids. So can we consider seizing therapy in these patients eventually? If immunosuppression is given for more than three years, achieving control of inflammation for more than two years, this is associated with a decreased risk of relapse after discontinuing non-alkylating immunosuppression. So I generally like to repeat my angiography as I uh, tend to, um, when I start seizing therapy, to ensure that the patient is truly quiescent and we need to taper slowly to avoid recurrence. So this is my algorithm for treatment of IU. So if local therapy uh, requires frequent injections and is not effective or relapses frequently, or there is bilateral severe disease, at presentation, it's best to give oral steroids. Systemic immunomodulatory therapy is indicated in the treatment of severe bilateral disease if corticosteroids are inadequate, not tolerated or contraindicated. If all treatment modalities fail to control inflammation, Fast panel vitrectomy may be performed along with IMT. Thank you very much. Perfect for yet another wonderful talk. And with this, now we have Manfred going to take over discussing controversies. First, thanks to everyone. Beautiful talks. And in time, I cannot believe this. This is amazing. So especially we have 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, especially with that topic. That's the point. So we have approximately 20 minutes and we should probably fill in 15 with the controversy. I think that's fine because there are some types of controversy, even if this is a basic uveitis cause. And controversy means not that we have different opinions because we don't like each other. It's the beginning of some new ideas. I think that's something we need. Um, can I ask you, um, I presented the concept of laterality for anterior uveitis. Do you think that's useful? That's something you also use as one of the first steps in your patients with anterior uveitis? Um, absolutely. I think that um, for diseases like HLA-B27, with the exception of the first episode, it is classically one eye at a time. And typically, like you said, alternating between eyes, although there's usually one eye that's the problem child. So they'll have left eye, left eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, left eye, left eye. The exception I found is um, the first episode is often bilateral, which I find very interesting. And it's often after some kind of obvious trigger. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a, a medical student with bilateral acute anterior uveitis the same week, his brother developed acute shoulder arthritis, and they had both been at a third brother's bachelor party. Wow. So I said, I really hope you guys all got uh, salmonella there 
uh, not chlamydia. Um, so they had all had an infectious trigger, bilateral acute anterior uveitis in one brother, uh, arthritis in another. So the, 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 the first episodes may be bilateral and maybe, you know, then you think of the tinu spectrum, but B27 can also present bilaterally for the first episode. Mm -hmm. um, what about H as a characteristic finding in uh, intermediate uveitis? Again, we are not talking about the group of, let's say, 12 to 20 year old. That's a part where additional disorders sometimes start already, yes? But what about kids with intermediate uveitis younger than 10? Would you analyze something here? I, I, I work up everybody for syphilis, sarcoid, and TB, but I have to tell you that it's very rare that I find anything in the very young children. Um, the, the important thing is to do a neurologic review of systems and repeat it intermittently over the years. Because I've had a number of patients who at um, you know, age nine, 10 or 11 presented with idiopathic pars planitis, but then at age 18, 20, 25, turned out to have MS. So I Absolutely. just repeat a neuro review of systems. Absolutely. So one of the questions I think from the um, from the participants came up, how often would you do an MRI? I think we discussed that before. You both would probably also, Vishali, you also would suggest only to send them to neurologist for an MRI if you have clinical signs of metal sclerosis or if you want to start your TNF-alpha, uh, anti-TNF-alpha treatment. Never else. Mm -hmm. As Debra said, we also have two kids whom we diagnosed MS after 16 years of, you know, idiopathic yeah. variety of intermediate tubiitis. So the key is never to give up, probably, you know, be on the watch out for clinical signs. Yeah, so I just, I, I mentioned when I talked to the kids and the parents, I mentioned MS, that it's vanishingly unlikely, particularly in a child, but I discuss the symptoms and I just want to be told about them. And then when I remember at subsequent visits, not at every visit, I'll just quickly go through another neuro review of systems. I don't tend to pick it up on the review of systems. Usually I've told them and then they come in and they say, oh my God, Dr. Goldstein, this is what happened. And like you said, it could be 10, 20, even you know, 30 years after the intermediate uveitis. So I don't think that screening MRI is helpful because then are you going to do an MRI every year? I mean, that seems like a not a very good use of resources. Mm -hmm. I In think Singapore, I mentioned... it's rare. It's so rare to have MS for us. Even if we have a patient with optic neuritis, we don't that often diagnose MS. So definitely I would not do screening, but we would sure. educate the patients, you know, so that they are looking out for it and they inform us straight away. So to my knowledge, there has never been a patient known in Japan with this uh, combination. This is amazing. So whenever we have someone from Japan who has seen such a Japanese patient, it uh, would be interesting to have a, a message from you, yes? But otherwise, it seems to be some racial, some thing there. There was another question which I answered in this regard. But let's stay probably with some very dangerous thing with intermediate uveitis. Let me tell you that each patient which develops intermediate uveitis in the form of sno with snowballs, with the age of, let's say, 40, for me, is suggestive for vitro retinal lymphoma. And I would do actually the whole normal workup for these patients, not even to mention patients with 6T, 6-0. These people don't develop normally the regular idiopathic uh, intermediate uveitis. Would you agree I'm to gonna, this? I'm going to say that I have a different experience. I see a lot of sarcoid in my practice. So Caucasians with sarcoid over age 60 very often present with anterior intermediate, UV, anterior intermediate and maybe a few little choroidal lesions, but I see a ton of sarcoid. So I always think about lymphoma, but we have a lot of sarcoid in my world. Thanks so much. One, that's in addition. Yes, exactly. But that's, I talked about I, idiopathic intermediate uveitis. Yeah. Yes. No, if I, you I, find I, I sarcoid, don't. that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. So an interesting thing is I get referred patients very frequently that are immunosuppressed for whatever reason. Um, so they're immunosuppressed because of cancer or because of pulmonary fibrosis. And they're older patients, they're in their 70s and they come in with intermediate uveitis and somebody puts them on prednisone. So here's a point, immunosuppressed old people 
don't get intermediate uveitis that is non-infectious or not malignant. So in these patients, you always have to think about infection or malignancy. Mm -hmm. True. Manfred, in continuity of what Deborah said, like in our setup, around the age of 40 or maybe younger in that age group, if we see snowballs, but no snow banking, again, tuberculosis is very common. I'm not talking about the idiopathic hair, but I'm just talking of large snowballs hanging in the vitreous, and we never ever see snow banking, wet nose are some of those chronic changes in TB intermediate uveitis. The same for me in Singapore. It's all TB. Yeah. 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 To be honest, I've never seen intermediate uveitis and TB in our country. Deborah may have seen a few of these probably. Uh, would someone from both of you, Vichali and Sun Faik, probably be able to differentiate it clinically idiopathic from TB induced uh, intermediate uveitis? Is there anything different? What about the vessels? Any change there which let things let us think about this could be TB? No. Maybe blood based radius sinecki because of the chronicity uh, sometimes in the I see that chamber. also in idiopathic, even idiopathic and in intermediate uveitis. I see synechia, yes. But what about the classic, you know, the classical picture, I think Deborah mentioned that already, the classical picture of intermediate uveitis in sarcoid is that here and in TB, you have a chance to leave a pattern. There is no way for me from anterior uveitis to switch to intermediate uveitis or to switch with snowballs to switch to posterior uveitis. Yes, there is hardly any way, if not infectious, and then syphilis could do that. TB and sarcoid can do that. And this is so typical. Yes. So we see these um, peripheral granulomatous changes, choroidal changes. Is that the similar thing in TB? Uh, Manfred, we always do not see choroidal involvement in intermediate uveitis because if we have choroidal involvement, even on ICG, we will not call it intermediate uveitis. Yeah. So when we are talking about intermediate, we're talking about intermediate uveitis and not panuveitis. Yeah. yeah. But that's a change which is normally not, not seen in intermediate uveitis. Yeah. That's right. So that's fine. Um, can I talk shortly? Uh, I think I have to discuss that with Deborah uh, because TINU, tubular interstitial nephritis with uveitis, is something at least which in Singapore is more than rare. Uh, Vishali, you see that in India? Not much. I'm always looking for it. But so then don't... let me simply tell the following and you tell me if I'm not correct. Tinu can induce anterior, intermediate, and posterior uveitis. I think yes. the only person I've ever seen who has seen posterior uveitis in Tinu is Deborah. Yeah. Can you oh, give Janet me Davis. Janet short, Davis as well. Janet Davis, can you short description of posterior uveitis in Tinu? Sure. The classic thing they get is little tiny choroidal lesions. They're like, they're sort of the, the size of Dalen Fuchs nodule. So they're, they don't tend to be these large, granulomas that we can see in sarcoid and in tuberculosis. Um, so we see, we, we tend to look at it in patients with bilateral acute anterior uveitis. That's the classic teaching. But very often, if you look, you see little choroidal lesions. We also see retinal vasculitis on fluorescein and clinically as well. Um, I've seen neovascularization of the disc. I've seen vitreous hemorrhage. So I think there's a lot of unrecognized posterior involvement. Next hypothesis, it is difficult to treat without steroids. They start nicely to respond to steroids, even systemic steroids. My experience is with all types of Tino syndrome, if you reduce the steroids, then you are getting into trouble. You need, I most think- of, you need Most of mine end up on systemic immunomodulatory therapy. Yes, same as me, definitely. And, so, and uh, I had- um, we just published our TINU patients and I had one patient in that series, only one of my TINU patients where the 
renal disease was guiding therapy because in all the other ones, the renal disease goes away and it's the eye disease that guides therapy. So this one patient that was being managed for her renal disease, nephrology after six years, tapered her cell sept, she just came back with uveitis. So now the uveitis is guiding therapy and now I'm up to 100% where the uveitis guides therapy. Well, that's very important. Who is guiding the treatment if yeah. you have an associated disorder? Probably to all of you who are listening and you are not too much familiar with uveitis, do not expect too much systemic disease, even if your disease may be associated with some systemic, uh, systemic diseases. Yes, sarcoid, the most severe lung sarcoid, don't show anything in the eye. So typically you have grade one, grade two. Don't expect in all TB cases that you find easily lung TB. Yes, look for JIA. The worse the eye, the less problems kids have in their joints and so on. So it's, it's sometimes really a little bit difficult. So my- so That's a super important point. Um, I just saw again this, what day is today? Today, Saturday, Thursday, I just saw a new uveitis patient who is 18 years old was diagnosed with JIA at age two, treated with systemic non-steroidals from age two to age three. And then mm. they said, your joints are fine, you're cured. By the time she came in to see me, she had a white cataract in one eye and 358 degrees of posterior synechia. So minimal trivial joint disease and horrifying eye disease. Yeah. Okay, and probably the, one of the final things is, um, um, we did not include that classical disease in our reasons to induce uveitis, diabetes. Do you think that diabetes has its own value to induce uveitis? I'm always the one talking, but I'll talk, fine. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as diabetic uveitis, but I think all uveitis is made worse by bad diabetes. So yeah. my sarcoidosis patients with posterior segment disease, with diabetic retinopathy as well, do much worse than either the diabetics or the sarcoids. I think mm -hmm. that um, an, an, even a non-uveitic non diabetic patient who gets cataract surgery can have prolonged leakage into the anterior chamber, prolonged flare and few cells. But I don't think that diabetes itself causes uveitis. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Manfred? Um, no, it does not cause. But it makes things difficult, definitely, yes. So when I see patients which are diabetics uh, or which m may look like becoming diabetic with my treatment, I'm not happy to treat them alone. I always need a partner with internal medicine and to tell them, listen, uh, we will try our best. And I think steroids are not really nice for these people. It's another reason, besides another, a lot of other things, that we really should change to immunosuppressive treatment. I think these people are easier to, to guide them. Um, I think there were a few more questions to viral anterior uveitis. To be honest, um, I think we do not have the time to discuss that one, but please have a look for the registration in our, uh, on our uh, internet page. Um, I think one of the next three or four webinars will be really related only to viral induced anterior uveitis. And you will find a very similar group here as you have here today, because that's something we are really burning for the viral anterior uveitis. It's extremely important and it's a disaster how this sometimes get treated or neglected or whatever. I think there's a lot of things we really have to discuss. Any comments from your side still? So I just got one question uh, offline about um, sudden onset bilateral acute anterior uveitis in kids that isn't TINU. And I think there's a spectrum. Um, Andrea Birnbaum and I published many years ago on bilateral acute anterior uveitis in children. And I think there's a spectrum of pure tubular interstitial nephritis, pure bilateral acute anterior uveitis that may be post-viral, post-antibiotic, and then on the spectrum, TINU is somewhere in the middle or somewhere along that spectrum. But I think that we can see a post-infectious acute anterior uveitis or a post-antibiotic or post-nonsteroidal acute anterior uveitis in children that is like TINU even if there's no renal disease. So that was a question offline. 
Would you agree to the following, following statement? Um, you are checking for Tino when you have a bilateral anterior uveitis, always. Yes. Uh, if you do not have other reasons for this one, of yes. course, yes. Have you ever seen, after some time, of course, after some time, simply only one-eyed Tino syndrome? So that's an amazing question. So we typically worked up only bilateral acute anterior uveitis in children. And then we found out, well, it's not just kids. I have a 90-year-old with TINU, actually biopsy-proven TINU in a 90-year-old. So then we said, okay, so it's all age groups. But now we see, okay, but it can be a pan-uveitis with intermediate uveitis and retinal granulomas. But we're still saying, well, we only look for it with bilateral disease. And certainly over time, there's often only one eye that's involved. The question is, should we just be working up everybody for it? Because we say it's bilateral acute because that's how it was reported the first time. It Very was reported good. in young Asian women. But now we find out that men are more common than women. So I think it's ascertainment bias. And it may be that if we worked up everybody, we'd find Tinu in unilateral, in posterior, etc. That's good. Yeah. Bishali? Manfred, I just have one comment to make. Uh, since most of our attendees would be comprehensive ophthalmologists, uh, you know, so we need to tell them what is more common, Debra, and what are the situations in particular would you look for, Tino? Would you do it in all the children who are presenting to you with the first episode? And what are the usual things you would do uh, say for an ophthalmologist who is just a comprehensive ophthalmologist. So the most common, at least given our ascertainment, is bilateral acute anterior uveitis. And there's really often a systemic prodrome. So all of us who take care of uveitis patients ask, have you been sick recently? Any fevers, any myalgias, any sore throat? So certainly, the most common would be a young patient with bilateral acute anterior uveitis with a systemic prodrome. The easiest way to screen for this is urine beta-2 microglobulin. That is not specific. It's just telling us that there is interstitial renal disease and we're spilling protein, but that is the easiest screening test. We obviously also wanna know what other renal function things there are. So we test renal function, um, particularly creatinine. But so that's what I would do if I was just giving a blanket statement is bilateral acute anterior uveitis. Think about TINU, in, as long as your lab can do urine beta-2 microglobulin, it is not an invasive test and it's not an expensive test. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have reached our time. This was really fun. Thanks Great. so much. Yeah, it was fun for me too, amazing, yeah. yes. So let me suggest we have now 30, questions in would it be possible that we four still go to the questions and answer sure. whatever you feel them. thinks i was also answering sure. the whole time but yeah. it's sure. our, our listeners uh, participants are really highly active and that's what we want so let me tell you thanks so much for participating um, at late time, at normal time, on a weekend, and so on. I think it's the only way that we can really make it that everyone can join us here. We will continue. I think the next one, the next meeting will be the fourth basic science course, and that's dedicated this time, of course, to posterior uveitis, which is also a major, major field, very important. And um, Again, for everyone who has not listened to my introduction words, you should get, if you're really uh, registered here, you should get immediately after that one here, after the webinar, your evaluation form. If not, use the address, the email contact, which is in our system in and ask where you get this uh, evaluation form with me in CC so that I see how much problems we have here. Um, the videos are available for everyone who was not able to see him, to join us here. And otherwise, thanks so much to all of you and um, have a lovely weekend to all of you. Thanks so Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go quickly through the and questions to do a few. Probably someone of you can 
think about the surgery questions, Sunfaik. There are some Sunikia questions and AC tap and things like that. Sis Manfred is answering. Okay. Debra is wake up awake now. She'll answer all yeah. the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was three cups of coffee for me. That's okay. That means I won't go back and take a nap after this and I will catch up on work I haven't done for the last few months. Okay. Oh, some of them are just thank yous. That's nice. Yeah, a lot of things. That's... <laughs> Regarding Tinu, the nephrologist can't do biopsy unless off steroids. Yes. I would not do stero uh, biopsy immediately. I'm very careful with that one. Deborah? Uh, what was the question about biopsy? Would you do? Would you suggest biopsy for Tino? Of the eye? No. No. Of the of the uh, kidney. Kidneys? Well, I don't do it myself. Not knowing exactly where. The I would not support live. it. I would not support it. Oh yeah, no. Our nephrologists all do. So we send at least the pediatric ones. We send them to nephrology, and they typically biopsy. You know, the question is: the patient should be off steroids while doing biopsy. Renal biopsy. That's right. So uh, a very interesting thing um, from Annabelle Okada um, regarding um, uh, diabetic uveitis. So as we've all said, we see very different patient populations. So Dr. Okada says that in Japan, they see diabetic anterior uveitis. She says it's usually males with incredibly high serum glucose, often with an A1C over 12, um, mm. no other causes of uveitis identified. So um, genetic factors can certainly make a difference. I've never seen it, but I trust Dr. Okada. Probably she should publish that. She yes. did apparently in BJO. It's in BJO and I will look for it. Okay. Question from Annabelle. Annabelle. There is a question for you, Debbie, from Annabelle. She says, hi, Debbie, this is Annabella from Tokyo. I absolutely do believe in diabetic anterior uveitis. Yes, yeah. I think that's just, what she mentioned. Talked, yeah. yeah, we just talked about that, yeah. And then there was another question, are there clinical features suggestive of, tar of sarcoid? So I think it's really hard to diagnose sarcoid with straight up intermediate uveitis. I think the reason that so much of her intermediate uveitis is idiopathic is cells in the vitreous are cells in the vitreous. That's it, it's not exciting. So if the cells are really large, we can think about um, a malignancy, but otherwise there's nothing characteristic about the cells that would make me think of sarcoid. So it's if there's granulomatous anterior uveitis or if it's intermediate and posterior uveitis. But otherwise, this is why I work everybody up in my world for syphilis, sarcoid, and TB. In my world, the most common diagnosis is sarcoid. And then I worry about syphilis because the treatment is different and we, um, we can blind the patient if we don't make the diagnosis. And I work everybody up for TB because I think it's very hard to tell sarcoid from TB. So, you know, Dr. Gupta sees less sarcoid and more TB. I see more sarcoid and less TB, but I think of both of them always. But there's nothing particular about cells in the vitreous. Unlike the patterns that we see in anterior uveitis, where the location of the KP, the color of the KP, the size of the KP can help us cells in the vitreous are not that exciting and they're not that revealing to us of why they are there. And there's another question, why do you think babies are stellate in uh, fukes? Um, I did yeah. answer that already, yeah. Because, Any idea? Uh, yeah, I mean, they are infectious. I'm not sure exactly what cells they are, but uh, all the infectious uveitis tend to have static KPs. <laughs> and my answer is always, I have no idea. No idea. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> yeah. So there's a question for you, Sun Fake. How do you taper and discontinue methotrexate and adalubimab in intermediate uveitis? Wait, how come you're so fast? I'm just reading the top of the questions. Just... Yeah, let's go through the questions first, probably. Yeah. There's still 34 questions, Patrick. Well, some of them are just thank you. Yeah. 
Don't think. Yeah. Celia, I have to go for another talk. No problem. <laughs> Did you see if there was any question for you? There is one. Can I have dark yellow dense hypopion in TB? Yeah, sometimes. Not that I have seen, but Ratinum has reported pigmented hypopion. I do it for you, yes? Yes. Just tap it and see. It could be fungus as well. Can you practice steroid challenge in a patient with hypopion? Do you practice steroid challenge in a patient with hypopion? Sorry? Hmm. So there's a question on, do you practice steroid challenge in a patient with hypopion to differentiate it between infective and non-infective? Oh, I would not do that. Because for me, it's a, uh, in fact, sorry, not an infectious sign. Well, you have signs of endophthalmitis, of course, yeah. But if you have a classical uh, immune response against this one, you may get some good response with steroids, actually, like TB, for example. I think it won't get worse easily. If it's uh, endophthalmitis, if you think about endophthalmitis, I would do the AC tap, definitely. So I just reply better the tap investigate to obtain a definitive cause okay. diagnosis. Okay, yeah. How to diagnose vaccinates in a patient after carriage? Okay. Okay, we're getting through these. Okay, we're going to be here all day. <laughs> no, we are going, we reduced it already. We are working with all three, you know. So there was one question that I'm answering, but I'm going to say it out loud too. So the question was an intermediate uveitis. What is the drug of choice of immunomodulatory therapy? I just and answered. I oh, oh, me too. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> no, but, but I think that we can talk about that. I don't think that there's any one drug for any one no, disease. I no. think it depends on, on disease severity, how rapidly you need treatment and patient factors. So I never want an 18 year old on methotrexate because they drink too much and they get pregnant by accident. So I think that, you know, uh, an older alcoholic with liver disease, anything with hepatic uh, side effects is a bad choice. Mm. Young people who are going to be irresponsible about drinking and getting pregnant, methotrexate. Um, you know, somebody with a strong family history of MS, maybe I would avoid um, TNF inhibitors. So I think it's all patient specific rather than location specific or even diagnosis specific. So I am answered that one in the way that I suggest first metotrexate or mycophenolate, and then in a second step, probably adalimumab. 
but, but you're right. Yes, it's, yeah. you know, this is too general, these questions. You have to know much more information about these things. It's, it's completely true. When does IU go in remission after how many yeah. years of disease, you know? Anywhere between six months and 700 years. Sounds like, like guaranteed I, I, final answer. I respond to that one, yeah? Impossible to say. Yeah. Between a few. Uh-oh, there's also some questions in the chat. And... Yeah, it's so hard to answer those because yeah. I don't. I tried to answer, but I, I didn't know how to reply. Yeah. If things are too difficult, try to make it really short. Yeah. I know, but, but how do you answer the chat? The chat? Yeah. You somebody can't answer in the chat it said, um, interesting Caucasian with dark brown irides. Um, we see lots of Caucasians with dark brown irides. Um, so that wasn't, uh, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Oh my God, there's more. We were down to 24 and now we're up to 25. 26. Oh my God. Well, I have my appointment this evening for the vaccination at six o'clock, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> and actually, I'm missing my daughter's <laughs> ceremony at West Point now. So. Oh, no, I please not. not. Yes, absolutely. Please. Please. Thank please. You. please. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I'm missing it in person. Deborah, like thanks so online. much. Okay. Thanks so thanks, much. Guys. This was so much fun. Thanks. Give thanks. my best greetings to your grateful dad, daughter, okay? I will. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So, to our left. What do you mean by seeing short cause of OP in treatment of AAU? What does that mean? Did you understand the question? One second. You know, Manfred, maybe you do it from below and I do it from above. Okay, I'm more on the... Okay, then I go down, okay? Yeah, you go down so we don't okay, overlap. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you all for the interesting meet. Well, I get these things and I can answer that quickly. Aren't you lucky? Just Pleasure. say thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah. What do you mean by saying short course of OP in treatment of AA? I don't know. Can you ask what they mean with OP? That's probably a wrong, a, uh, something wrong. I don't mm -hmm. know what OP is. I saw that question too. I couldn't answer. Short cause of oral prednisolone. Could it be oral prednisolone? Could be. Yes. O yeah, oral prednisolone. What do you mean by
Oh, it goes down. Is your threshold for treating retinal vasculitis? Ha, huh, that's a good question. That's what I wanted to know. Uh, what, what is your threshold for treating retinal vasculitis in IU? Yeah. What is it? Treatment? Threshold. Oh, okay. Which is what I was asking. Yeah. Do you treat the peripheral one that doesn't affect the vision? Down to 10. You see that? <gasps> I'm tired already. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> definitive test for TB. There's no definitive test for TB. No.
Sunfaik. Mm. There's someone who seems to have uh, sent a message before, and now he adds some information. Rana Amin. Can you check this one if you go down a little bit? It's a, a brown R-A. Mm. Have you answered no. that one? No. Have you answered? No. No. They are all he, he, it's one above the other. It looks like an additional question. So I, I, I take care for I don't know whether it's in the chat. Okay. Well, the I'm chat sure. hopefully, let me quickly check this one, but the chat, we don't answer the chat. Sorry. We mentioned that multiple times. Mm. No, that was not so much. No, we cannot go to the chat. Okay, I answer this one. They are all in a negative world that normal inflammation happens. Normal age. Yeah, I think I saw something in the chat. Um, from him? From this person. Yeah? Okay, let me check. Oh, yeah. Hmm? Maybe more so, the chat has disappeared. No, I cannot see that. Mm. Do you have the time when he says this question? When he sends this question? There's a timeline here on the website. Three. Sorry? It's, quite, it's after the webinar, actually, strangely. It's after the webinar. When, mm. what, what time is it in? It's now 10.28. It ended at about 10. They all A and A negative. Maybe he's talking oh. to new, no, anterior evages. Yeah, the problem is we have our own time here. You have your time and I have my time here. So that makes it impossible. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, the, the last few that came in, came in after the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's in keeping with my time. Mm, they're all ANA negative. All have normal inflammatory, normal A's. Two had elevated ASOT. Um, all had normal microphone. So I think so, this is about the discussion on TNU, you know? So we're talking about, you know, the spectrum of TNU. Mm. And they need not all have a nephritis, and some may just have like bilateral um, non granulomatous anterior uveitis and develop vitritis or even oh. granulomas in the. It doesn't fungus. make any sense for me here. The first part is missing here. So I'm, I sent him, we need to begin off the question, okay? Mm. Then we, that's impossible otherwise. Because Debra said also some of these may have a trigger, and that's that's why he talked about the raised ASOT, I think. Okay, never mind. What the cause of coat select exudates in IU? And how do you treat them? Do you do you know the answer to this? I don't. Which one? What what the cause? What is the cause of coat select exudates in IU? No. And how do you treat them? I don't know. I cannot answer this one. I start on top now, yeah? The first, the first the one about... That's quotes. Well, the top for thing? me is recurrent post schlossmann syndrome. Oh, okay. What is your approach when dealing with patients with no fundus and severe anterior uveitis?
So you also don't know about exudates in codes, yes? So no. I say we don't know. Must be allowed. <laughs> wow, of course. <laughs> and I see that you are giving the next one. Mm, yeah. Look. So I will tell here. A P D U P. What's NSD? Which um, vasculitis condition can present with NSD? Serous detachment, is it? Um, Neurosensitive. Okay. Neurosensitive. Well, each type of vasculitis. Huh? Yeah. Especially under treatment. In case this in, in. Do you use oral antiviral? In pregnant women, I see that, yes. I don't know. It's safe. It's, it's safe. safe? Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, you got an answer there. And it's the neurosensory detection. Yep. Manfred, that's the yeah. last question. You were asking what's NSD, right? Neurosensory detachment. Yeah. I've answered that one already, oh. I think. Yes. That you can have it in all types, especially in steroids. We're done. We're done. Okay. We're done. Oh, some more. Okay, we have to finish this now. No, no, no. Look at that. Not. It's still coming in. Oh my goodness me. Four have just appeared. I saw you very special posterior sinicure. 
people's eyes and we try I to take the last one. I take the last one. Okay, I hope that the last is okay, so Okay, this is the same. What is this? I saw a patient with austere sinicia in both eyes, which I this without aspenitis. So that's you know, cyclitis. Let me answer this one. Okay. Um, I would call it uh, probably iridocyclitis if there are no snow snow balls otherwise intermediate uveitis okay mm -hmm. okay we close this now and it's done yeah zum Freik, thanks so much thank you was it okay for you the meeting yes yes i trimmed Wonderful. my talk right Wonderful talk, yes. <laughs> oh, it's always that we learn a lot, really. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Have okay. a beautiful weekend. Yes, you too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>